Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you I just have a couple announcements here to talk to you about. First of all, I want to tell you that we have devotions online, a JS app, um, every single day, Monday through Friday. And uh, you can just get your day started right, tune in. It's a short little, uh, you never know who's going to be speaking to you. It's a short little devotion, but it gets the day started. And then at 5 p.m., we have something called Live at 5, and you never know what they're going to be doing. They are lifting, they're going to have songs. There is uh, cooking shows. Oh my gosh, Audrey's cooking shows are so much fun. We have got people that are uh, talking about what they're doing, what they're doing for hobbies. Uh, it's just a great time. It's live at five and it gives you something to look forward to maybe trying that you haven't tried before. It's a great program. Then, of course, we've had car church and we had it and we have it at eight o'clock and at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings here. We're also, li we're also live online, different sermons. So if you're coming to Car Church, you can still tune in to hear Gerald on a whole different sermon, two sermons on a Sunday. And Car Church is such a blessing. Just last week, I got to take my 12-year-old grandson and I told him, I said, you need to see this because you're living through history right now with a pandemic. And you're gonna be able to grow up and tell your kids about that that you had to go to church and stay in a car. And then we also are starting something brand new tomorrow, Wednesday, 6.30, car church at night. Yes, that's right. BJ is gonna be teaching in our parking lot Wednesday night at 6.30. Worship team is gonna be worshiping and we are gonna be proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ and still have a sense of community, family together, worshiping the Lord in our cars. So I hope to see you there. God bless you.
the king of my heart Be the mountain where I run The fountain I drink from Oh, he is my son Let the king of my heart Be the shadow where I
hear your words, Lord. We thank you so much for who you are. We are weak, Lord, but you are strong. Give us that faith to trust in what you say, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We pray for your anointing upon Marilee and all the ladies that are out there, Lord, listening, Lord. We just pray your love upon them. In your name we pray, amen. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord. He answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered. I've heard many reports about this man and of all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me. <laughs> so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. <laughs> he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus.
movie. It, it displays what we're going to be talking about in Acts chapter 9. But before we get into the word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to come alongside of us, Lord, each of us individually, wherever we're at, wherever we're listening, and whatever day we're listening on, that you would come and you would teach us, that you would speak to the hearts that are out there, Father. We thank you for everything you are and everything you're doing still. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 9 in Acts, it says here, verse 1, And Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Saul, full of anger. You know, his name means asked for. And you know what I think is kind of funny is he's asking for it. You know, how much more can you do to God's saints before God stands up for them and God fights for them? And so here we see the anger of Paul. He is built up. He has been raised to be of that of the Pharisees. He has anger towards Christians. And he is actually a terrorist. Somebody that wants to kill somebody for what they believe. That's nothing more than a terrorist. Built up rage, offenses, hate. And this kind of hate will hollow you out from the inside out. It will hollow you from the inside out. Rage, hate, jealousy, all of these offenses that he's let brew in his heart changes a person to do brittle to do brutal things to God's people. It says here in verse 2, and the letters he asked for from the synagogue of Damascus so that he may be found of those who were in the way whether men or women that he may bring them bound to Jerusalem. He has no boundaries. He's taking the men, he's taking the women. He goes out after them. He's on the attack because he is so unchecked in his emotions and what he feels when it comes to Christianity. He is unbridled with hate. The Bible says here in Ephesians chapter four, verse 26, do not let the sun go down on your anger, nor give way to Satan to have a stronghold. It is a command that the Lord wants us to know that if we let it brood, it will have you do things you never dreamed of doing. Go visit a prison sometime. Talk to them. What happened? I killed somebody. I never dreamed I'd kill somebody. How did it happen? I was mad for years and I went after them. That's why the Lord wants us to clean up our hearts that we don't become hollow on the inside. And only God can take care of our hearts like that. Verse three, it says, as he journeyed, he came to Damascus and suddenly there was a light that shone around him for heaven, from heaven. God is always watching you. The good, the bad, the horrid, and the ugly. He's watching. And it says here that suddenly there was a light that came to him. Suddenly, God will deal with you at some time, either here on earth or when you stand before him for the judgment. God will get your attention. He was not out of the reach. He, Saul wasn't somebody that said, oh, God can't touch me. Look at this. I'm going to persecute. God's going, I'll show you who I am. And this blinding light that came upon him. It's really, uh, doing this study is always so much more of a blessing for me probably than it is for you because you start to realize how awesome God is. And this bright, this bright light, this luminous that came over him was also mentioned here in the transfiguration, which is in Matthew chapter 17. And you can jot these down and read them together. Stephen, Acts chapter seven, verse 55, when Stephen Stephen lifted up his eyes and he saw the glory of God. And also in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, when John looked up. And in John, he describes it as lightning, thunder, and voices is what came upon him. And this same glory 
this magnificent God is going to ascend on evil Saul. You know, we can be zealous for the wrong thing. There are so many people in our world that are zealous for their career or they're zealous for um, their family or they're zealous for a cause and they go out and march. We've even seen it now when we have the, the virus that we're dealing with and people are zealous for different things. Some think you should wear a mask, some saying you shouldn't wear a mask. We can be zealous for the wrong thing. Well, Saul is being zealous to kill Christians. The opposition is coming against Christianity and these are God's people. God does wonders when he's after somebody and he's watching and he's seeing Saul. Verse four, it says, he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He fell to the ground, pompous, arrogant, self-righteous Saul. He falls to the ground. When you come in contact with the living God, you can't stand. It says in the word, he fell to the ground. He's probably never fallen to anyone. And now he's flat in the dust. When God deals with you and shows you who you are, it will make you bow before him humbly. God struck him with his illuminous light and he's dealing with the sin in Saul. That's what God does with us. When we go away from him, if we never want to know him, he will deal with you. And it's either going to be here on earth, as I said before, it's going to be when you stand before him and he plays out to you all the times you rejected him when you could have accepted him. Maybe you're listening today. Maybe someone's forwarded this, this to you and you're the one making fun of Christians. In our world today, maybe you're the one that hates anything to do with Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus has some things to say to you about that. It says here, he fell to the ground, helpless in the glory of God. When you stand before a living God, a living God is coming into your heart, you are helpless because he is supreme. He is the one that made you. And God starts to deal with him in four different reasons. Well, first one is he's gonna be dealing with his hearing. He's gonna consume him. He's gonna deal with him in his sight. He's gonna deal with him in the emotional. All of that healing that needs to take place. He's gonna put him in darkness so he can deal with him. Sometimes we have to get really low before we will look up to God. And that was Saul. He was as low as you possibly can go in God's eyes. And it says here that he felt, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? They're gonna go, we didn't persecuting you, Jesus. But Jesus is saying, anything you do wrong against the people that are lifting up my name, you're doing it to me. Jesus is gonna say, you're doing it to me. Whatever you have done to offend, you did it directly to God. And I like that. That rank comforts me. That if anyone does anything to you, God watches you. The word says you're the apple of his eye. Whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. And so here it says, he fell to the ground. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you filled with hate? Why are you filled this morning with hate? God wants to deal with that. He wants us to confess our sins. And it says here, Saul said, who are you, master? He's on the ground, he's in the dust, and he's no longer arrogant. He's no longer this horrible man God is dealing with Saul because he loves him. When God deals with us so many times, it's because he loves us too much to let us go on what we are. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, Saul, Saul's a whosoever, <laughs> believes on him will not perish and go to hell but will have everlasting life. 
And so he says, who are you, master? Saul's on the ground, face in the dust, can't see, going, what in the world is happening to me? Right in the middle of the sin, God shows up. Right in the middle. And it says here, he said, who are you, master? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? Jesus said, when you were killing my people, you were killing me. When you were offending them and rustling up the women that they had to go to prison because they, they loved me, you did that personally to me. And he said, is it hard for you to kick against the goads? The interpretation for the word goads is a sharpened stick used to prod against a stubborn animal. You probably know some of them. I know some of them. And God is going to start to deal with him. And it says in the word in verse 6, he said, trembling and astonished, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? He finally will submit but he fought against the goads Saul did for years, persecuting God's people. Some people will fight God to their own hurt and then get up and go do it all over again, whatever they did, until they're really just a bloody mess. And have you ever seen when somebody gets hurt and then imagine this, the hurt makes them matter. So they go back and do it again. And then the hurt makes them matter. He's dealing with his rage. He's dealing with his anger. He's dealing with all of this in him right now. Is it hard for you to kick against spikes? Wooden javelins. He's going, we use this for stubborn people. God's using it instead of for an animal, he's using it for Saul because his heart was hard. And then in verse six, the most marvelous thing happens. He gave up. You need to give up and stop enforcing your way and how it should go and just give it to God. Finally, Saul's senses are coming that he's no longer in charge. That's a big thing. People like power and they like to, to flaunt about what they could do to someone else or how great they are. And all of a sudden, without anyone else witnessing to him, he gets saved. Because when Jesus speaks to your heart, you want to give it to him. The whole heart you want to give to the Lord Jesus Christ. Trembling, astonished, and he said, Saul said, I give up. Lord, what do you want me to do? See, God has marching orders for all of us. And we're going to look at all these different people with marching orders in these next verses. And God had a plan for Saul even when he was so far away from him. God knew him and was watching him. And this light this brightness that God speaking to his heart humbled him. It brought him to the belief that there was a Lord, Jesus Christ. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's what we need to do this morning. In the midst of our virus and the people that are so frightened, what is it, Lord, you would want me to do for you? He finally is getting it right because God is dealing with his heart and he's appearing to him and he's taking away the anger, the bitterness, the hatred, and he's dealing with him. And now Saul believes. No one's out of God's reach. No one's out of salvation. We think they could be. I'm sure back then the Christians that were being arrested were going, Saul's, he is so much more powerful than anything we can think of and what he's doing and persecuting us and sending papers and taking our women. And, and they thought he was so powerful. And God goes, watch this. Face in the dust. And now he gets it. 
Now he understands he's not God. What do you want me to do for you? And then the Lord said to him, arise, stop. He's in the dust. His face is down. He knows Jesus is right there. Jesus is talking to him. He's having a one-on-one conversion of his heart before the Lord. He is humbled. He, he doesn't know what to do. He's just going, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? And then Jesus says this, arise. He brings us down to realize what we are, our need for him. And then he rises us back up again. He didn't stay there and say, shame on you. And I saw everything you did. And you are just a piece of dirt. Just like your face is in the dirt, you're in the dirt. Which maybe some of us would have thought like doing. But he said, get up. Nothing is unforgivable. I love that about the Lord. God said, get up. Verse six, and go to a city and you will be told what you must do. Marching orders. Marching orders. Get up. I've dealt with you. Now get up out of that mire. Get up out of the dust. He met him right there when he humbled himself. And he said, here, arise and go. In verse 7, it says, the men who journeyed with him stood speechless. They, they stood speechless. They heard everything that was going on. It's not clear if they heard what Jesus was exactly, but they saw the light. They knew what was happening. They were speechless, astonished. What was that? We heard voice. We saw light. We saw this bright, and Saul's on the ground. What was that? And truly, it is speechless when God starts dealing with your heart. Stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Some of the different commentaries said that they believed that they heard a voice, like blah, 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 almost like a muffled voice. And then Paul was hearing it very clearly because it was directed right at him. It says here, Saul arose from the ground. And I hope you have that underlined in your word. Arise, and he got up. He's believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's on his Damascus road where he meets his maker. And all of us will be there someday. And many of you that are listening to me today, you're already there. You have had that conversion where the Lord comes into your heart. Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one because the bright light burnt his retinas. Think of that. That's how bright and now his eyes are blind. He looked at him. You know, right now, I'm, this isn't really our comfort zone because we're doing everything online. And normally I have all these women that I'm talking to, but right now, I'm just talking to a camera. And I have bright lights on me right now. And if you look away quickly, you'll see little spots here and there. And this is nothing. This is just lights that are on. Can you imagine his eyes? And he got up, he went to get up, and he can see anyone. They were totally burnt. And it says here, they got him up from the ground and he saw no one, but they led him and they brought him into Damascus. His friends are standing there going, man, God was dealing with you. That, I don't, we don't know what that was, but boy. And can you imagine what they must have thought about? They were friends of his going, we better stop this. This, this is serious stuff. God is real. And it says here, they led him and he was in the place without sight and he never didn't drink for three days. He's blind. Can you imagine in that darkness and recalling everything that just happened to him and replaying it in his mind that Jesus was there Maybe he's seeing right now the faces of those that he helped stone. Maybe in that darkness right now as, as God's took it from him, he's watching Stephen crying out to the Lord. 
Because remember how proud they were to, to make Saul pleased that the ones that were stoning him, they laid down their garments at his feet. Yay, see what we did? Aren't you happy with the Saul? And maybe he's seeing all of this. And it's so serious what's going on with him. He can't see. He's alone in a city. His friends are probably freaked out. And here he is and he can't eat and he can't drink three days without sight. He was forced to seek God. You know, fasting is a wonderful thing that we can do when we have strong petitions the Lord wants to bring before him and he honors that. And I'm not sure how that works. I just know that he honors it. In Joel chapter two, verses 12, it says, now therefore the Lord said, turn to me with all your heart. Turn to me with fasting and weeping and with mourning. Rend your heart not your garments, return to me, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in kindness, and he relents in doing harm. He honors uh, when we just fast. There's been many times in my life that I needed a breakthrough. Many times probably in your life you just needed that to be answered. And I would fast. I'd go before the Lord and I'd just fast and I wouldn't eat. I would drink water. But I mean, I just, I just wanted to show the Lord. And I think a lot of that is when it's fasting is it shows the sincerity of your heart that you're serious. God's like, when you get serious, I'll answer you. Many times I have took something that needed a de desperate answer and fasted. Reminds me of one time I was in Africa my, my husband was very sick at this time, but he hadn't been diagnosed with liver cancer. And I'm in Africa, and I'm with my friend Tracy, and they had a lady there that was a prayer warrior. Let me tell you something. Africans know how to pray. They know how to worship. It was so amazing to watch all this. And, and she had um, kind of the gift of prophecy. She would pray over people. God would give her a word. And uh, I was teaching over there a Bible study and she came up afterwards and I had mentioned that my husband was sick and asked for prayer. She come up to me afterwards and she said, I'm going to go away to the mountain to pray for your husband for three days. And when I see you at the end of the week, I will let you know the answer. And I was like, you're gonna fast for someone you've never met? I mean, think of that. I mean, it's one thing to fast for our family members or something that's happening to us directly, but this lady said, I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna fast for your husband. And I will come back and I will tell you what I think is gonna happen. And the Lord had already spoke to me quite a bit about what was going on in Brent's life. But at the end of the week, this lady came back and she walked up and she was over to the side and I was over here and she just looked at me. Not a word was said. She just looked at me. And then I knew. I had been feeling all along that the Lord was gonna take Brent home, but then I knew. Fasting is interesting what it brings up in the spiritual world. God honors it. And so here it says, he was there without eating and drinking. And it says here, there is a certain disciple in Damascus. Paul's over here blind and praying, getting real with God, that conversion was real. And now there's a certain disciple that God is gonna use. I wanna be that certain disciple. Don't you, don't you wanna be that when the Lord has a task for him to do, that God is gonna be moving, that he goes, I pick, there you are, I can pick her. She knows me. We talk a lot. I'll pick her to do the task. A certain disciple at Damascus, and his name was Ananias, and it means favored one of God. He's like, I, I can depend on Ananias. I know Ananias. And he said to him, he said to the Lord, and the Lord said to him in a vision. So the Lord is gonna be talking to him in a vision Ananias is going about just loving God, just being who Ananias is. 
and the Lord is gonna come and say, I have something for you to do. And he does that with us. He will come to you and he will say, I have something I want you to do. And it may be something that you've never done before. And Ananias said, here I am, Lord. What a wonderful response. Here I am, ready and willing to do whatever you want me to do. Reminds me of some of our Bible college kids. They left jobs, they left family. They didn't know one person. They come to some place called Yucca Valley full of cactus. What do you want me to do? Ananias was ready and willing to do what God wanted him to do. And so it says in, in verse 11, the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street that's called straight. I like that for many reasons, but actually the street that's called straight um, means main street. So he goes, I want you to go out to the main street um, and go over there, arise and go to the street called Main, uh, Straight Street, and inquire in the house of Judas, for there is one, a Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he is praying. He knows where you were born. That was Turkey. He knows where he was born. He knows what he was doing. Then he's in Syria and Damascus. God knows where he's at. He goes, there's a guy there named Saul. But what I love, 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 is it says, behold, he is praying. Ladies, God sees you praying. Whether it's, it's like at your bedside or you're praying on the way to work, but he sees when you pray. Is there any reason why you wouldn't want to pray? when you know God's watching it. He sees your prayers. He sees you praying. He said, hey, Ananias, there's a guy named Saul that's in this house and I want you to go to him because he's praying. Ananias is gonna be the answer to Saul's dilemma. Ananias is going to be the answer to prayer. Did you ever think that you reaching up and reaching out to people that you could be the answer to their prayer? I think of the, the many people that I've had the privilege to lead to the Lord throughout my years. What a blessed time to be an answer to prayer to somebody that had been praying for that person and then they come to church and they accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior. What amazing task it would be to be the answer to someone's prayer. He's gonna use Ananias, and he says, go because he's been praying. In verse 12, and in a vision, I have given him a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he can receive his sight. Now God is working with Ananias at the same time he's working with Saul. He's given them both a vision. And in that vision, there will be orders on what to do. I love, we talked last week about our steps are ordered by the Lord. It says here, and behold, and I've told Saul that you're coming. I've already spoke to him in his blindness that he's gonna meet you. And then Ananias answered the Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. What I love about Ananias is that he is gonna talk with the Lord about the task he's called to do says in Isaiah 4, 21, bring forth your strong reasonings, says the Lord, that you go before him when you don't understand or you have a question, that you're not afraid of him, that he's gonna fry you because Ananias speaks up. Ananias, favorite of the Lord, he has something to say and he goes, Lord, he's horrible. Have you ever done that in prayer? You ever told the Lord, he's horrible, she's horrible. That's what he's saying to God. And he said, God, he's killing your saints. See, Ananias is a matured 
Christian and he totally gets it. That as they were doing that to the believers, they were doing that to Jesus. He said, they have caused much harm to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. He has that authority. God is calling Ananias to a dangerous situation. Sometimes God will ask you to do something that scares you. I can think of my life probably five, six different times the Lord's asked me to do something that scared me. It actually took everything I had to do it, to walk through it. But you know what? He will never leave you nor forsake you. And if he's called you, he will guide you in that. Are you being called to a dangerous situation today? Are you being called in something that scares you? Well, God is going to be speaking to Saul. But first, Ananias must obey. I love that about Ananias. And it says here in verse 15, The Lord said to him, Go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. I want you to go because I've changed Saul. Ladies, people can change. When they come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and are completely sold out, they can change and then he says, Lord, what he was trying to say, the Lord Ananias was saying, what if I'm arrested? They've arrested everyone else. What if I fail? What if I go out there and I'm arrested and I don't even get to Saul? Think of all the questions he's had. Think of all the questions you've had. They made no sense at all. He's being called to a terrorist. And that's all he knows of him other than what God is telling him about him says here, go, he is a chosen vessel. I love the illustration about a doctor with a scalpel. And the doctor's skilled, and the doctor knows what exactly to do to bring a healing. But the scalpel itself just lays there on the table. It doesn't do anything until it's in the doctor's hands. And the doctor picks up that instrument and he starts the healing process. And that's what God does to us. He doesn't just leave us there. He works with us. He chose you. He's chosen me. He is wanting us to be the chosen vessel, an instrument for God to use. Maybe to something scary. Maybe to use you to something you're afraid to do. And for some of you, it could be as simple as witnessing to your in-laws. And for some of you, it can be a terrifying experience that God's asking you to step on a plane and do something you'd never dream or go visit someone you'd never see. It says here, go, he's a chosen vessel. Paul, Saul has changed. And you know, I love that about the Lord. Only the Lord can change a heart. But when he does, we're never the same. And he says, I have called him to the Gentiles Think of what would have happened had Ananias not gone and didn't want to go. Looked at the marching orders and said, yeah, not me. Don't you call me the terrorist. I've been here loving you, serving you. Don't make me go. Pick somebody else. But Ananias obeys what the Lord has ordered him to do. And then the Lord gives him some encouragement to Ananias and he says, because of what Saul's called to do, you're going to be an instrument of that also. Because I've already told him you're coming. God knew that Ananias was going to go. But Ananias is working through it and trusting the Lord. And I love that. And it says, verse 16, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my sake. The Lord is there with him. He's praying. Saul's praying for three days, blind still. And God's just revealing what he's going to be doing with him over and over again. What he's done in the middle of the Damascus road and what he will be. Ananias plays a part because he chose to go. When God asks you to do something, choose to go. 
Let, let yourself be the scalpel that the doctor's gonna use for something huge for him or for something very small for him. Let him use you as a doctor would a scalpel. And it says here, he's gonna be going and talking to Saul and Saul has the reputation of somebody that was totally against God and a terrorist. God changes him and do you know what God's gonna do? He's gonna overrule his reputation. You no longer have to be the way you were. If you're clean in the Lord, you're clean indeed. If you're forgiven, you're forgiven indeed. If you love him, you are forgiven indeed. And now ladies, forgive yourself. Saul is gonna be dealing with all of this. And so it says here in verse 17, and Ananias went his way and he entered his house. He went ahead and he believed that God was speaking to him. He went away and he entered his house and he did just what the Lord said that he told Saul he was doing. He laid his hands on him and he said these words, stupid man, how dare you crucify people? How dare you? He looks at him, Ananias, the enemy, the terrorist, the one that was horrible to people that loved Jesus Christ. And now because God's told him he is accepted, he looks at him and he says, Brother Saul, we're not to remember what other people have done in their past either. God, who he forgives, he forgives completely. He ruins that bad reputation. It's wiped clean. You are a new man is what the Bible says. You're a new woman in the Lord, no matter what you've done in the past. Accept who you are now, the new woman that loves Jesus. Do not concentrate on what you were. And so here Ananias, he went his way. He entered the house, laying hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to me on the road, has come to you, has sent me to you that you can receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord sent me to you. Let's be an Ananias. Girls, let's, let's be the one God can depend on in a very sad world right now in a world that's gripped with fear, in a world that has unrest, let's be the one that God can depend on to reach others. You know, churches all over the world are doing live broadcasts like we're doing and, and they're, you know, they're using all the media that's up to them. And I believe that's, we're the dependable ones. We want to be dependable for the Lord to preach God's word. But God wants you to be dependable so you can minister to the hurting. Let's be like Saul when he looked up and says, what do you want me to do? What, show me what I'm supposed to do. And God has a task for him. Even when he was away from him, God still reached out and loved him. He said, I'm gonna lay my hands on you because God's already given you the vision I was going to. Because, see, he wanted him to know that God was working in both of them. Ananias overcame the fear to go. Ananias didn't let that stunt him when he wanted to ask the Lord, but God, are you sure that's the one? Ananias still obeyed even in the fear. We must obey God in the fear. And it says here, Verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. I was kind of thinking, you know, something maybe like fish scales that were in his eyes, that they're scales. And in the Hebrew, the word means scales, okay? So scales, whatever those are, fell out of his eyes. They fell from his eyes. God had blinded him, and now they're gonna fall off immediately, immediately. And you know what, ladies, sometimes God answers our prayers immediately. Even if we're fasting, sometimes it takes 
a long time to see the prayers answered. But the God that made you sees you praying. If you take one thing away from this today, take that away, that you're in full view of God when you're saying your prayers to him, when you're petitioning him, when you're asking for forgiveness, you're in full view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately the scales fell off. He received his sight at once and he rose and was baptized. Saul saying, immerse me, take everything of me. I want whatever I need to do. And right then he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's come upon him because he's gonna need to be filled with the Spirit with boldness because God is giving him marching orders that's gonna change everything. See, the Jews thought that they were the chosen ones and they are the only ones that could be right and they were the only ones that could be saved, the Messiah. Even some believe the Messiah came to just them. But he's calling Saul, terrorist Saul, to now be beloved Saul, to go and lift up his name to everyone. That me, a Gentile, you, a Gentile, can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That same Jesus is for us. Not just for a few people over here, but for the entire world. And verse 19 in closing, it says, he had re- after he had received food, he was strengthened. About fasting, if you're on medication, be wise. <laughs> Maybe you need to have a piece of bread. Maybe you need to like, you know, make sure you're drinking lots of water. Be wise. It's been three days since he's eaten and now he's strengthened, he's healed and he goes and eats. You know, we want to be wise when we fast, but it doesn't say, you could just be fasting from you know, a heavy meal and just peacing throughout the day for your stomach's sake. I don't know what you're going through, but God does. And it says he got up and now he can see. Can you imagine what that must have felt like if you've been blinded for three days, total darkness, burnt retinas, and now you open your eyes and it's like perfect vision again. See, God makes you right. God changes lives and he changed Saul. And Saul spent some days there with the disciples in Damascus. The very enemies that he wanted to kill, he wants to become. I believe that started, like I mentioned earlier, when he saw Stephen and what he had done and what he approved of to that. And then God starts dealing with him. Now, the very people he was killing, he's sitting with. And you know what I love? They're sitting with him too. We're called to love in a generation that's evil, in a generation that uh, we don't agree with what's happening. The Bible says, pray for our leaders, pray for them. So many times you just want to smack them. But you know what? God says, pray for them. So in this time, let's be a praying group of women. Let's be the one that go, what do you want me to do? You're calling me to something that makes me afraid or scary. I'm still going to go. And be the dependable saint for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you see him, believe me, you'll be so glad you did. Inconvenience yourself for the kingdom of God. And great is your reward in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray this went out to who needed to hear it, that you are a life-changing God and you meet us right where we're at and you see our prayers, you know our hearts. And you have marching orders for each of us to do. In Saul, he had marching orders, And in Ananias, both at the same time were doing what you told them to do. Let us be the women that are doing what you've asked. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, ladies.